please tell us a story with numerous asides and a whole bunch of other diversions that are only slightly related to the overall theme commented nobody ever. Please excuse the uh, ambient white noise, but it's February. February. What's the subject today? Um, I don't know. Elements? These pellets are iron, or some type of iron ore. The point is that their principal constituent element is iron. You know, the main ingredient in steel. They're kind of heavy and they oxidize iron oxide, you know? They rust if you let the air get to them. Latin Fe ferrous, non ferrous metals are metals that don't contain iron. I, I was cleaning this jar just now and there were globs of a glue on it, but it wasn't a glue at all, it was shellac. You can scrape it off with a razor blade and add denatured alcohol to it. And actually get usable shellac out of it. You can do the same with paint can labels. If you peel the paper off, sometimes there'll be globs of shellac that hold the paper on. Here are a couple of other elements that I've collected over the years. These two are the principal ingredients in gunpowder. Sulfur. Carbon. Uh, in this form, some type of graphite. These two are very heavy. Zinc and copper. These two are used to make pennies. Older pennies are 100% copper. Newer ones have zinc in the middle. If you mix these two together as an alloy, you get brass. If you were to instead replace the zinc with this, these two mixed together would be bronze. This one's also heavy. This is tin. Softer though. Much softer than this. This one is comparatively lightweight. Have any idea what it is? This is silicon. Not silicone like this. Silicon. Yeah, that's what happens to a tube of caulking that sits for too long. Use it or lose it. <laughs> this one here is a pretty one. This is a bismuth crystal. And if you've never seen this process, uh, there's a video. Nighthawk has a video that you must see. It's actually something that you could potentially do at home, but the crystal it's just, it's just, it's just beautiful. Down here, not so beautiful. This toxic substance, I'm not even going to take it out. Uh, there's plenty of YouTube videos that you can look at of people foolishly playing with this. Mercury, HG, Latin hydrogyrum, quicksilver. Yeah, nasty stuff. Fun to play with. In the jar, it feels heavy, really heavy. You can feel it sloshing back and forth as though it almost feels like there are BBs or something in the jar. A lesser known property of the stuff is that it readily am amalgamates with other metals. That is, uh, it will mix and make a cold alloy with other metals like, oh, I don't know, gold silver. It will certainly amalgamate with this one, I remember, for sure. This is aluminum, or this is some alloy of aluminum. If you add the extra syllable alum aluminum, that's fine. I don't care. I don't, it doesn't interest me. Uh, here, we call it aluminum. And the aluminum that you know, like this, it's just melted pop and beer cans from a fire. Uh, it's actually an alloy of quite a number of elements. Principal among them, magnesium. Oh, this one is manganese. It's hard, brittle, and cold. And you add it to steel to make it more rust resistant. So, here's your beer can aluminum. 
it's an alloy of a whole bunch of stuff, mostly pure aluminum and magnesium. Pure aluminum is kind of hard to come by. Where did I get this? That's part of the long story. So about 15 years ago, and again this is pure magnesium. The white dust coming off first it kind of resembles baby powder. It's just aluminum, or rather magnesium oxide. And then if we scrape it away, underneath we get. Sorry about the noise. So about 15 years ago, I'm riding in a golf cart with an engineer across the factory floor, going to the labs on the backside, and. I could see the furnaces off to the side, and I said, like, oh, let's stop there, I want to see them, and he's like, no, you don't, you don't want to go anywhere near those, stay the hell away from that, you don't want to job anywhere near that. He was right, anything furnace related is just simply hellish. Well, later on, I ended up near furnaces, and we had a little pot furnace that we would stick chunks of magnesium like this into the pure aluminum to, to modify the alloy so that it would have the properties that we wanted for the tests that we were doing. Now here we have some magnesium oxide. Magnesium burns hot. You have seen it in road flares, which those will pretty much burn underwater. So once you start a magnesium fire, it's pretty tough to put it out. And now that more than a decade has passed, I can admit to this. <laughs> we, when we were adding the magnesium, wait, first back up. When you melt molten aluminum, it's not what you think if you've never seen it before. Now I know you've seen YouTube videos and you think you understand what it's like, but until you're in its presence, it's not what you suspect, probably. It has a pink color and it's somewhat translucent. You can kind of see through it. It kind of reminds me of when you shine a flashlight behind your hand and you, it, you can see through it, kind of. It has kind of a eerie glow like that. And the substance is kind of mercury-like in, in, the, in the sense that it's a heavy liquid that you can stir, but it's also very tar-like and sticky. So if you were to dip a tool into it and pull it out, which always remember another thing when you dip a metal tool into aluminum, heat the tool first and make sure it isn't rusty because you have to watch for thermite reactions. Look that up. A lot of YouTube all-stars are playing with uh, liquid metal in ways that are extremely irresponsible. You have to make sure that your tools are moisture-free and rust-free and nice and hot, as anything that you add to the pot should be uh, as well. Where was I? Oh uh, yeah, so it's very tar-like. If you need to, if you stick a tool into the aluminum and you pull it out and you want to clean the tool off with a piece of fire blanket or something, it's very much like roof cement or roof tar. It doesn't want to come off. It is a hellish substance. The most messy, nasty, vile substance you've ever experienced. It looks fun on the internet, but playing with liquid metal is, like that engineer told me, not what you want to do. Well, sometimes when no one was looking, I'll admit to this now, we would, you know, when we had to add our magnesium content to alter the alloy. This is lighter, so if you throw it into the aluminum, it will just rest on top, and so you would have to take a tool and hold it underwater, at which time it would melt and disperse through the metal. It looked like a dark colored wax would spread through the alloy and you would have to hold it under water so it melted underwater, under aluminum so it melted. If you didn't, 
it would just sit on the top and guess what? That's right. <laughs> Combust. And it was something to see. We had fume hoods and everything else so that if it happened, it was not anything that was even remotely unexpected. But you're not really supposed to do it because it's wasteful. But my goodness, it's violent. If you see a chunk of this size in an uncontrolled oxidization reaction on top of a molten pot of aluminum, geez, that would be a viral video. We would pour out these samples of the alloys that we were supposed to make and we were aiming for a, a certain percentage. This being pure aluminum, this being some finished pop can alloy. And we would add various metals to get the, the alloy correct, to have the correct levels. So how did we know what the levels were? You, you might think, well, when you bake a cake, you measure out in a cup how much flour, butter, eggs you put in, and you can quantify before you bake. But with mixing an alloy, it's not, the, it's not so easy because of what I just told you. There's slag on the top, or what do they call it, dross or whatever, impurities that you skim off the top to remove, and some of the metals that you add oxidize. Uh, there's just a lot of variables that have to be controlled for. And so getting a, a perfect alloy requires some careful measurement and instrumentation. So what did we do? When you burn something, it emits a very specific frequency of light that is specific to the el elements that com comprise it. So in this case, when magnesium burns, it makes a very specific type of white light. And you can measure that light and based on the spectrum that it displays, you can determine the constituent atoms that are in the compound that you just burned. Too long didn't listen? When you burn, it makes a certain color. And then you can measure that color and tell what you just burned. <laughs> okay, so you would take this sample and you would put it in this big giant computer that had a robot bot arm that would move samples around. It was pretty wild. And an electrode comes down and it, and it makes just a little tiny spark plug gap there and then you follow some safety protocols and type on the password and it goes and it puts a you know an elect a, an, a plasma stream stream through it and at that point that the plasma goes through it the electricity goes through it it oxidizes you know it, it burns some of the atoms in the alloy and then there's a million little camera lens type things that measure the color of the light and so then we would go over to the printer and it would give us a a printout of what all the percentages of, of that cons the constituent atoms were. And it knew. It was right. You couldn't fool it. It knew whether or not we were pissing around burning magnesium on top of the alloy or not. How did it know? Math. It's math. You can't fool it. So I had a friend one time, he was arguing with me over, well, his argument was such that there is no possible way that we can know if there are planets around other stars. And now one might think that it's complete witchcraft that we could know what all of the constituent metals are in very precise amounts in a sample that we have no idea what it is. And similarly, in, on the large scale, in far away things like distant stars, it, it's tempting to think that there's just too much of a barrier to common sense and we can't understand what's there. But similarly, we can measure the light that comes from stars and tell numerically what the stars are made of 
And okay, we can also measure the amount of light. So if you have a star and then the star blinks and lets off less light over a certain period of exposure, that suggests that something made a shadow in front of it. And you can measure that shadow and use mathematics, again, to determine whether or not there are planets moving around that body of light. So, well, I think healthy skepticism is good. Don't let ignorance cause you to become dismissive. And that's the whole point of this story. <laughs> Thanks for listening. The main subject here today was elements. And you can think of elements kind of the way that you think of Legos. Yes, I know the plural form of Legos is Lego. I don't care. Each of the specific colors of Legos are what elements would be. So a compound is like something that you make out of Legos that has a whole bunch of different colors in it. And that's what these are. When you look at something like rocks and minerals, this one, for example, pyrite, fool's gold, it's iron something, I can't remember what else is in it, or this dragon glass, <laughs> or rather obsidian, it's a volcanic glass, it's silicon dioxide. In, in a tetrahedral configuration, it, it makes like quartz crystals, like amethyst. Please remember, keep in, pr in perspective before you make any sort of technical corrections here, that the goal is to be conceptual because there's a lot of you and some of you have chemistry degrees and then others of you didn't know the difference between a compound and an element before you watched this video. And so I'm addressing a lot of different types of people and I'm really trying to talk to all of you as equals because we're all at different states of development in our journey. All right, later on.